Welcome to the Soccer Geeks Podcast, hosted by Jason Barbato. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Soccer Geeks Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Barbato, co-hosted by Twitter royalty, if you compare oh. audiences, Marissa Kelly. Marissa, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. I am so excited for today, and uh, thank you for that ego boost. I appreciate Boom. it. <laughs> gotcha. I got your back always. I'm, yeah. Y- yes. Thank you. Um, yeah. So we have a really exciting episode today. I would like to give you the honors of introducing our guest, and then uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Speaking of royalty, we have <laughs> U.S. soccer royalty that's about ready to be in y'all's presence today let's go ahead and welcome miss shannon mcmillan to our show mrs shannon McMillan to our show. Jen, how you doing welcome i'm well thanks for having me that's being awfully generous with that royalty tag oh let me tell you we we got that tiara this morning we were polishing up and i think you wear it well so we're real excited to have you today thanks so much for making time for us on the podcast uh, appreciate you guys having me nice to be here um cool. i can't wait to get into the conversation marissa do you have anything to add before you head out No, I I will be right here watching and admiring the conversation. So enjoy both of you. Thanks, Thanks, Marissa. Appreciate it. Um, Shannon, we're going to jump into it. I wanted to discuss kind of just where, gosh, you wear, not only do you wear a a wonderful tiara, but you also wear a lot of hats. You are an executive director of Del Mar Carmel Valley Sharks here in San Diego, one of the few or one of the three ECNL clubs in the county. Mm -hmm. Um, You're also the VP of comms for San Diego Loyal. Your mom, <laughs> you, you, have, you wear a lot of hats. Um, can you talk a little bit about what it's like to kind of balance all it is that you have to do and all the investment that you are making into the game today here in the county? I'm still looking for more hours in the day. So if you have that secret, feel free. Um, definitely have my hands full, but you know, I am truly blessed with the most amazing 12 year old son, Braden, who is just by far the, the greatest thing, greatest accomplishment um, out of everything I've been blessed to do. So that that's the easy part, even though he's, you know, in the tweener years that there's some bumps with that. Um, but I just, I feel really fortunate because the game of soccer truly helps shape who I am as a person, as a mom, as a friend, um, without a doubt, um, uh, oh, who I was as a soccer player to my college coach. So now that I'm on the older side and retired, it's really, really important to continue to get back to the game, help the game grow. And having grown up here in San Diego, um, it's just, it's so amazing that I'm able to do this in my hometown. Yeah, which is wonderful, right? Because you've gotten to see how the game and the clubs and the landscape has really evolved. You know, there was there was a time in San Diego when there really wasn't much beyond youth leagues that was going around. The Flash was here for quite a while. The soccer's have always been a staple and always been wonderful. I know that you you always get down with the with the uh, the pro and the media side, making sure that you nutmeg a couple people here and there, but uh, which is always wonderful to see. Um, as just a, an executive director for the club, mm-hmm. for, for Del Mar Sharks, um, I wanted to just see if we could kind of talk a little bit about some of the challenges that you like are just facing in the climate that we've got today. We can, we can talk along the lines about COVID. We can talk about budget, retaining players year over years. I just kind of wanted to dive down that, that little lane a little bit and kind of see some of the things that you're facing as just a club director. Yeah, and it, it's a lot. This in itself could be its own uh, series of 50 podcasts, I think. Um, but, you know, it comes down to it's kind of come big business where players are being recruited and they're being promised the world. And at the end of the day, the soccer pyramid goes from everyone playing rec and it, it gets smaller. And, you know, the percentage that go on to play for the national team. Uh, play collegiately, play professionally is so small. So what's really important, and since I joined the Sharks about 13 years ago, was how do we teach these kids life lessons that are going to help them beyond the game? Because in fairness, by the time, especially nowadays with the pressure of social media and all that stuff on these kids, you see more and more kids getting burned out and just walking away from the game. So while we have their attention and their, their, their passion, what tools can we give them from the teamwork, overcoming adversity, the leadership, the time management of juggling homework and soccer practice? You know, what life lessons can we instill in them so that because everyone's going to have adversity, everyone's journey is different through the game in life, in school, everything. 
And when they have those obstacles, are they going to have tools to find their way through it rather than turn around and give up? So just trying to really help them get these basic fundamental life lessons that the game offers so that when they're out in the world, they can be better people for it. And, and what were some of those tools that you have found that have been really effective for, I mean, and, and then if you can kind of just say like, you know, there, I, I would imagine there's certain tools that are applicable to high school and to middle school and to elementary age, but what are some of the different tools um, you've seen that have been um, really effective? Yeah, you know, the big one for me was confidence. Um, I grew up in Escondido and went up to the University of Portland and I was scared of my own shadow. I, you know, was really fortunate at the time um, to be recruited and I went on a bunch of recruiting trips and these coaches were promising me the world. You're going to start. We're going to get you on the national team. You're going to score all these goals. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. And then I went up to this small private Catholic school in Portland, 2,500 undergrads. And the coach, Clive Charles, brought me in for the weekend, didn't talk to me the entire weekend. And I'm like, wait, everyone else was, you know, all up in my face, building me up. And about a couple hours before my flight, he sat me down and he just said, hey, you know, we think you'll be a good fit here. I'm like, okay, well, am I going to play? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I'm like, you know, he's like, oh, I don't know. And I'm like looking around like, okay, where's the candid camera? You know, that shows how old I am, candid camera. Um, you know, we're looking like who's, who's pulling the prank on me. And then he just said, look, all I know is I can give you the opportunity. It's up to you what you do with the opportunity. I don't know if you're going to play. You know, you could have an injury. You might be in a slump, whatever. He's like, but it's going to be up to you. And it was the first moment in my career where I went, wow, this is someone that truly cares about me as a person. Yeah. And it was through Clive and the program up at Portland that I learned to pick my head up. And I learned that it's okay to look people in the eye and it's okay to be a strong, confident, kick butt woman who is going to go out and play their heart out and, ha and then have these tools to take off the field and be successful right. in the classroom and in friendships and relationships and everything else that comes with it. So for me, the big one was the confidence and the leadership being able, you know, there's all kinds of leaders. You've got a Julie Foudy who's going to scream and yell every time you have the ball and you think you got to get it to even though she has three people on you. And then you have the Joy Fawcett's who are silent, but they lead by their action. Yeah. And they just, they're the ones you always know where they're at and what they're doing. So, um, again, all that stuff that you carry over into how you are as a human being and a person and interacting with other people. So we have a pay to play system, right? Yeah. And so there's a certain level of, <laughs> there's a certain level and that's not going to change. I mean, we all know that there's, it's, it's highly likely that that whole system is not going to change. But we, but it also creates for an environment where parents also expect a certain level from development on mm -hmm. on the field, right? And they also expect a little bit off off the field. So there's this this kind of like additional pressure on the coaches and the club yes. for performance. And you know, it seems like what you're saying is there. Sometimes it's it is case by case, but it's it's a real it's a long slow burn. And most people are expecting results immediately. So, how do you, as a club director, you know, choose coaches and set a tempo and a culture of a club when we're living in a microwave or like a Twitter society where we want to yeah. refresh every two seconds and we want to know we want to know right now? I mean, how do you temper that really well for for parents? Yeah, and you know, I. We often joke other directors like if we could take the parents out of the picture. This would be the best job in the world if it was just about the kids and teaching them and um, that um, because the parents do get in the way sometimes. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, in the pay to play, I, I see both sides, you know, growing up as a player who couldn't afford it. I was on scholarships with my club. So that's something that's super sensitive. And the yeah. Sharks would never, ever turn someone away just because of a financial. So we do have ways to do scholarships with volunteer opportunities um, and that type of stuff. But for me, it's really just been about from the get go uh, because I fought coming into the youth world back in 2009. I was like, it is crazy. It's out of control. I want nothing to do with it. And um, the Sharks president at the time, Marsha Turek had reached out and I was like, no, thank you. And she called back, she's like, are you sure? And I said, okay, if I do, it's gonna be about the kids and setting them up to succeed. And so from the get go, it's like, I don't, we don't hire fire coaches based on their record on the field. It's more about, are your kids enjoying the game? Are they getting better? And are they excited to get out of the car and come to practice? Are they excited to put that jersey on and show up at the field on that weekend? That's the 
parameters that we base the success of our coaches on, not who won. Um, you know, in fairness, there's not one college coach out there that's going to say, hey, at U10, did you win state cup? Hey, at U10, did you <laughs> sure. win this title? They don't care. Sure. You know, so that's about building that passion early on in those younger players that they're excited to come. They're excited to learn because when they get that adversity, maybe they go from being a starter to now they're coming off the bench. Do they have a pity party or do they use right. that as motivation to say, all right, right. coach, I'm going to prove you wrong. And that's and, the and they might of- do both. They, they're exactly. right because they're young. Yeah, I, yeah. I have a 10 year old daughter and that, that happens a lot. You know, there's some, mm-hmm. we, you know, she's kind of up and down. She's a little bit more of an artist. So some days, you know, <laughs> she's real excited and some days she's she's really not, um, you know, and you just kind of have to balance that and keep them engaged and involved because it's yeah. like I said earlier, it's it's kind of a long burn. Sorry, it my is. landscapers yeah. always decide to be here when I'm recording podcasts. It's That's all right. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's the blessing and the curse of San Diego, especially we can play soccer 360 days out of the year. So yep. what have these clubs done? Let's play 360 days out of the year versus I grew up playing basketball and softball. I ran track for a few weeks like I had that ability until I was probably a junior in high school when I honestly said soccer is the sport for me. Wow. wow. So nowadays, kids are being told at 10, 11, 12, pick your sport, dedicate yourself to it, and that's it. And what 10, 11, 12, I don't, I knew at that age, I had no idea what I wanted to do or what I was good at. Sure, sure. So I have a, a hard time pressure. finding that sometimes as an adult. I was going to say that, but. <laughs> That's fine. I'll be, I'll be honest. Yeah, you know, and I grew up kind of in that same vein, too. I played a lot of sports growing up. But I'm a little bit on the other end of the aisle where I actually wish pers- – this is just me personally. Mm-hmm. I actually wish I would have been more specialized in the sport because I was so frenetic in trying to find something that I could be really good at, and I never really found it. I feel that if I would have just narrowed my gaze a little bit and picked mm-hmm. one thing, I could have been maybe exceptional at that because I would have just had my heart more into it. Right. Um, and so I've kind of parented that way, and I'm kind of trying to reel that back and not live too vicariously for my kids – but also give them the opportunity. I, you know, like my daughter played Friday night lights with her soccer team this Love last it. year, you know, they, they had, a, they were playing in an all boys mm-hmm. league. They were an all girls team. You know, they were Love even it. a grade, you know, like fifth and sixth graders. They were all fifth graders and they had a couple fourth graders on their team, but they won actually won a couple games and they had <laughs> fun and they showed, they showed some of these boys, you know, what girls can do sometimes. And it was, uh, it was Love really it. great for their confidence. They had a blast. Um, stuff like that's really good. You know, mm-hmm. I, I am a big believer that, you know, sport is like the universal language. It's not just soccer. It really, it's sport, you know, being able to kick a soccer ball or throw a football or baseball. It's really important for kids to be able to connect with other people outside their sphere through sport and through games. So and the memories your daughter and her friends have for, you know, it's not going to be about any of the soccer games they won last year. It's going to be about, remember when we played football and we were the all female team in the men's boys league and we won a couple games and we did this. Like those are the fun times that they're going to really like talk about later on in life and, you know, with their kids, like put them in everything and have them experience that. Yeah. I I could not agree more. I could not agree more. Um, I was wondering if we might be able to kind of shift a little focus into talking about just coaching development. Um, We hinted a little bit about player development. I know that's something that your club is really, really, really big on. Um, But I want to talk a little bit about coaching development and kind of some of your approaches to, increasing coaches education and opportunities with the club and so i'm just kind of curious like what what's your take on that like licensing the whole the whole gambit yeah that, that's a, that's a great question because you know some of the best players that doesn't translate into you being the best coach and some of the players some of the better coaches now are actually players that weren't necessarily the top players on the field which is really awesome to see and i think that goes along with you know just because you passed a coaching course doesn't necessarily mean you're this certain level coach and you should get paid this and you should only have these teams i think it's really about who you are as a person because as soccer coaches we're teachers and we're blessed with the most amazing opportunity especially through COVID. these kids that were all of a sudden life grinded to a halt we're doing zoom lessons and we're telling our coaches like be creative have them run around the house doing scavenger hunts like yeah yeah it was an outlet for these kids and as coaches just like teachers we have the ability to really make a positive impact in the lives of these kids and you know just as we have the opportunity to make a poor impact so it's really about finding the right people that want to teach they want to give back to the game um, and licensing as important as it is and I do think there is a value for it I don't think it's the end-all be-all yeah. um, and similar to us not hiring firing coaches based on levels 
we do promote and we help coaches attain licensing financially and we do encourage it. But it's not at the end of the day, the end all be all, because being able to study and go run one session is different from managing a team, yeah. especially here in San Diego, again, where we can play so long. We don't have that snow period where we're shut down for three months and kids are doing basketball because it's indoor or volleyball. So it's really about who can make these connections with the kids and know the game and the level, because it does take special coaches to be able to relate and have the patience um, for lower level teams and younger age teams. Yeah. You know, and, and the challenging thing too, even with coaching education is that, you know, not to knock the Federation, but there's not a lot of class opportunities and they fill up incredibly fast and, you know, that's and they're expensive. Thing. it's, it's very pricey. I mean, two things I, I know that, it would be really wonderful if the Federation were to double or triple the number of classes and cut the cost by a third. We've had a lot of conversations uh, on this podcast, and I don't know where this episode will end up in the number, but a lot of the conversations I've had with coaches and with club directors and, and people who have played the game and growing up is that uh, coaching education they see as one of the biggest areas of need for the growth of the game yeah. in our country. Yeah. And, and we, we focus a lot on players and the number of kids playing and the number mm -hmm. of teams that are there. Um, and, I, and I just wonder at what point we're going to see yeah. – you know, education for coaches as being like a, a really intensive focus. Yeah. Um, and I've seen time and time again, the clubs that are really successful are the clubs that really invest in their coaches mm -hmm. to be the best that they can be X's and O's, but also interpersonal communication. Yep. I was just going to say, and it's beyond the X's and O's. It's really about how do you relate and how, you know, because how you show up to practice, can you read that little Johnny just got out of the car, his head's down. He probably just had the worst day at school. Like yeah. now, can you turn that day around for them versus getting in? And now, you know, he's had all, got all this going on in his mind, bad tests, you know, something this, that, or the other happened at school. And now you're on him and yelling and this and that versus, putting your arm around him and making it a fun day for him and yeah. turning that day around on that experience. And then now yeah. he knows he has soccer as a way to release. And, you know, no matter, cause that's how it was for me, no matter what happened at school or at home, like I got to the field, I crossed that white line, everything else disappeared for those two hours. And I got to go kick people and kick the ball and fly <laughs> and run and just let it all out. And then I left going, okay, now I can handle that. So right. that was your gym. Yeah, that's just as important as the X's and the O's. And that's really hard to teach people because you either yeah. have that innate ability to connect with people and kids or you don't. Yeah, and, I'll, and not just that part too, just you know, for coaches to also be willing to have a player that feels comfortable enough saying like, hey coach, like I've just had a really rough day, just so you know, like I'm not making excuses, but right. like I just got a lot on my mind, you know, and coaches yep. be like, yeah, cool. Like no problem. Some days are like that, you know? And, yep. and cause there can be a lot of pressure too for the environment for coaches. Cause it's, it's so darn competitive. We know that. Yep. I mean, I know that. I mean, I've had my kids play competitive for I think seven or eight years now, yeah. you know, and they're still very young. We started them out really young playing competitive. And it's just really hard to get yeah. all those little kind of things, things right. And that um, goes to the clubs recruiting, you know, if you were recruited in and we tell these players as they're being recruited, like what's to say they're not looking to out recruit you the minute you sign and the yeah. pressure on those kids versus realizing they can have that bad day and it's okay. Right. You know, and the coach wants to see what you do with the mistake on the field versus, you know, you're going to put your head down now or a man down or do you pick it up and get back, you know, like all those little life lessons again. Yeah, I talk to my girls. I'm like, we're not the sum of our mistakes and failures. You know, we're the sum of our character. I mean, that's really who you are. And you're going to yeah. win a lot of games. You're going to lose a lot of games. Yep. You're going to, you know, you might be 50-50 for passing. Right. But you might also have a couple key passes that really could change the game. Like, you're going to lose the ball. And it, that's me also preaching to myself so I don't, like, look at everything that happens as, you know, because we can bring – up watching the professional game then onto the youth level where mm -hmm. we expect and demand perfection from referees, from yep. coaches with substitutions or from formation and things like that. And we have to understand, yes, it's a job for a lot of coaches. Yes, it's a job for referees and they're getting compensated. And to some kids, it's their it's their job. You know, it's, it's something yeah. they're investing themselves into. We can't expect perfection. We have to just mm -hmm. kind of dial it back a little bit because mistakes are going to happen. It's okay. Yep. It's just a game. It's at the end of the day, it's just a game, right? Yep. Exactly. Um, well, in regards to kind of player development, what do you think are some of like the biggest mountains 
now let's talk about post COVID, mm-hmm. right? As so people know currently in the, the landscape we're in in California, I mean, a lot of kids are going to school every day, still wearing masks. Mm-hmm. I, I know that on the fields, you know, if you've got a percentage of players that are still wearing masks and having to breathe through a cloth or a N95 mask, you've got players that don't. So you have all this, the, that whole dynamic, but, um, what are some of just the development challenges now that we have basically lost the last two years in the game in development, large in part? Um, yeah, and that's it's you know, yeah, and navigating through all of this has just been insane because you know I actually had the conversation with my son about it a few months back and just said you know hey bud just realize like this is a once in a lifetime type event like I've never gone through this. Like yeah, God, we hope that's the case. <laughs> knock on wood, right? Yeah. I'm like, honestly, you probably will never. And it actually kind of, he, he's a very old soul. And he actually kind of was like, oh, okay. I'm like, so, you know, we're getting through it. It's not easy. No, I can't help you with the math homework without us. You know, he's a Macmillan. He's just as competitive. We're button heads. <laughs> um, and so, you know, you think about the high school players, seniors in high school. And because the colleges now are given the fifth year of eligibility, that class that was ready to graduate, there's no financial help. Scholarships are still tied up because now seniors are given an extra year. Right. Now they've right. lost that year. And now it, I mean, it, and it just trickles down. And that's where I think it's just really about getting the kids loving being outside and being healthy again. And we had, as we went through, you know, we, we formed a, um, a, a group. We had a pediatrician on there, a lawyer, just to make, help us navigate through all the ever changing Right. protocols and all that stuff. And we were a club that always erred on the side of caution. And we still are very much that way. And we had some families that were like, we're not coming back until there's a full blown proven cure and everyone's vaccinated to, yeah. I need to get my kid out of the house. How do I get yeah. him out of the house? So yeah. we had the whole gamut. So now it's like, now that we're getting back up and running and actually games and just seeing what a release it's been for the kids. It's just really about making sure they're getting the fundamentals and just having that release still because there's still so much i mean we get daily notifications from school of exposure and this and that and you know just trying to keep up on everything and keeping the kids safe but also making sure they have an outlet to be healthy yeah and for a lot of kids you know if they were in fifth grade when all this started you know they're about ready to be you know either an eighth grade or freshman in high school type deal like that's i mean if everybody remembers what middle school was like for you imagine doing it online or you know in a very distanced environment yeah. like what a catastrophic nightmare for for kids and and what a great release being on the soccer field with the yes. team and with the coach and, and playing in sport can actually have for kids it's just it's really positive one, one of the things i'm really hoping that comes out on the other side of this is that there's a lot like um, registration, you know, for clubs and for rec and for youth and the YMCA and AY and all these other programs is just busting at the seams with with parents that want to get their kids connected yeah. communally because I think it's just so important. Yeah. Um, you know, you talked a little bit about um, the you know the kids now that are trying to get into college and the freshmen and you know I, I want to pivot not necessarily talking about the college game but because you have so much experience with the national team and the, and the program um, I just kind of wanted to get kind of your thought um, you know the Federation came out recently and released their annual budget um, they talked about the youth teams and the different camps that they're gonna set up there's a big gap in there for the 04 and 05 age group mm-hmm. um, they didn't get camps the last two years it doesn't look like they're gonna get camps how do you as a club director, executive club director, and as a former national team player, like what are some of the channels you have to kind of raise alarm bells, if you will, if you think it's an alarming thing, but, yeah. but what, and to be an advocate for kids in this age group so we don't end up with like a talent gap like we had on the men's team or that we don't, like we're starting to kind of see a little bit of that aging gap like with, with the women's team as well. How do, we, how do we advocate for the 04 and 05 age group? Yeah. And, you know, anytime opportunity is taken away, it's, it's a loss and it's hard and it will create ripple effects down, you know, anytime there's changes like that. So it it is tough. You know, I think with sharks, we're very fortunate that we are an ECNL program, which ECNL, you know, has proven it is the elite club national league for a reason. And it's sustained other challengers coming up, other clubs, other leagues, I mean, and stuff. So we're very fortunate. We have that, 
platform to have the exposure for our players. Um, but it also just means coaches and college directors being more tied into and helping these kids navigate yeah. through that tough time and making sure they do get the exposure. And I think what's exciting though, is beyond college, especially on the women's side, you know, USL has just launched two women's leagues, yeah, the W league and the super league. And that doubled the professional opportunity for women, because you look at how small NWSL is 12 yeah. odd teams like that's yeah. not that many opportunities when you have 40,000 college players. So right. that just doubled, um, you know, and I think with USL on the men's side growing as well and popping up in more markets, anytime you get a chance to have that opportunity, it's incredible because there's players that fall through the crack from the club level to college, from the college level to the pros, to the pros, to the national team. And so anytime you have a platform and you can get out there and get exposure, it, it's it's valuable. Um, you know, I know there's players, Shannon Box from the national team. She was kind of in and out of the national team, didn't really solidify a spot, but then the WSA, the first version of the women's league comes along and she just finds her groove and blossoms in New York. And all of a sudden she becomes a stalwart on the US team. If right. not for WSA, she's someone else that would have just gone on with her career, whatever that would be. But instead she had the opportunity. So it's just really about continuing to have conversation and pushing the envelope to making sure these kids have pathways that are legit and about them, not about their club and what they're gonna get out of it or what they want and who they like and this, that, or the other, but just making sure there's clear, legit pathways um, and that they're supported. And if they can't financially cover it, how do you get them that opportunity still? Um, and just really, trying to alleviate the pressure there's there's enough pressure without that driven from at home or the club coaches or anything like that right and I, and i might get in trouble for saying you know it on the show because i you know i try not to take too many stances but i would wholeheartedly agree with you that ecnl is by far the best level of competition in the land my mm -hmm. daughter plays in the the gad dpl uh mm -hmm. kind of funnel if you will um and yeah like i mean it's just you know there there's there's a lot of kids that you know if they were in those opportunities uh in those leagues it would it would be very well do very yes. well for them o outside of i mean how do you look at as a club director you know again we talked about you know for our region one of three clubs that has ecnl can you talk about the relationship with other clubs in the area that aren't ECNL as far as giving kids access to those opportunities because it's very tribalistic in club soccer. It's very territorial. Um, as a club director, how do we not make it about dollars and how do we actually make it about kids and the opportunities for kids? Yeah. Like, it's not easy, right? Mm -hmm. And there are not willing players on the other, like willing parties on the other aisle all the time or hardly yeah. ever. How do yeah. you face that? How do you work? With that? I, you know, another great question. I think it comes down to the leadership and egos. And for us, you know, I, I remember <laughs> playing for Clive in college and players that wanted to transfer and he could have had them sit out a year because there was within conference. And he's like, look, if it's not a good fit for them here, who am I to pull a year of their play? And that's something that stuck with me at the time. So I'm like, yeah, but now we have to play against them. And he's like, yeah. hey, everyone's journey is different. And that's the same thing. You know, what we have at the Sharks, it might not be a good fit for someone. And that's OK. Sure. Who are we to say, no, you can't go, you can't leave? Where it gets ugly for me is when it's the recruiting and the backhanded and parents, you know, having conversations or coaches from other clubs coming up as players are walking off the field. Like, look, if your program's good enough, you'll find the players you're going to maintain sure. and retain the players. So, like, just put something out there that for me, I was fortunate and blessed to not only compete, but win at every level. So this isn't about me and my ego and yeah. winning. This is about giving back to the game and finding the right coaches because it does trickle down. And that's why I don't put the pressure on the coaches because I don't want the coaches to show up and put that pressure on them. Like we don't micromanage our coaches. We let them coach within obviously parameters of what the club wants to attain, but they're going to make mistakes too. Yeah. So if they're, they know they have the ability and the comfort to make the mistake and learn from it, that's going to pass down to their kids. So it's just really, I think it comes down to leadership and egos. Yeah. The safest place to make mistakes is with a group of people who believe in you, right? Yeah. That's the best place. That's why I was always drawn to team sports because yeah. you're going to have those days where, you know, as I was a forward, I was expected to score goals. I couldn't hit the broad side of a barn sometimes. <laughs> but those sure. are the days, you know, I heard Carla Overbeck, you know, hey, that's all right. Focus on your defending. 
get back and do this? How else can you contribute? And that's for me, I always really appreciated that support and that ability to make the mistakes. The old uh, Ted Lasso mentality before we knew it in uh, <laughs> yes, Apple, right? love that show. My son yeah. loves that show. Yeah. Well, uh, Shan, I want to round out the time that we have because I know that you're kind of crunched for time today, and I want to be able to talk about this last question a little bit. You know, one thing we always ask our guests on the show is this, is that since you are royalty, we're also not only going to give you the tiara, we want to also give you a wand, and we want you to be able to make one one sweeping wish change in U.S. soccer that takes with immediate effect. What change would you make, and what impact would that have today? I would make a sweeping wand move. Oh man, I, you know, I would have to just say that there, there's equity across the board. Okay. Um, you know, the women's games made great strides. We went from playing for per diem because we absolutely loved the game to going into residency periods um, because we didn't have a league. And, you know, I'm still working very hard today because I retired after 12 years, three Olympics, right. two World Cups, and I'm still working. Um, which is okay, but um, you know, there have been great strides made on the women's side, but I, I do think there should be more parity in, in the pay. Um, it is okay. the same job. Um, it's the same amount of time. And some might argue even more because um, you know, maternity leave and then sure. being the sole provider um, caregiver for the, for kids. So um, I think that would help trickle down too, um, and really just empower the younger players realizing that, you know, they don't have to go into a professional women's league and figure out a side hustle and drive right. Uber or, you know, what kind of jobs can allow them to have half the day off because they have to train and this and that, and just really allow them to become true professionals and truly, truly commit to the game. And I think that will help um, all the way up to the women's team take, continue to be dominant in the world. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a great I, I know that that that's a beating pulse within your heart Hot button. And, uh, <laughs> but but it's also something that, you know, is needed in the game. And it's, it's hard when everybody keeps saying it's just going to take time. But, you know, like you said before, man, the USLW League and the Super uh, Women's Super League coming in mm -hmm. is a huge stride in yes. expanding that. Um, and I, I you know, I would love to see as many professional women's teams in this country as men's. And I'd actually love to see double the number of men's professional leagues or yeah. professional teams, I should say, in our country happen in the next six or seven years. So yeah. I think we'll get there. It's hard waiting. I know that it feels like you've been waiting your lifetime. But we're it's been a while. Out. Yes. I won't say how long, but yeah, but <laughs> even beyond the U.S., you know, it's yeah. got to start at FIFA coming down. And, yeah. you know, it's amazing for me to see, you know, I'm a Man United fan and to see that they have a women's team and like, yeah. oh, I would have given any anything to go play over there so right. it is coming albeit very very slow yep we'll get there one day at a time yep. um, shannon i just want to say thanks so much for your time today uh, you have a a wealth of experience there's a, a hundred different roads we could have traveled on conversationally <laughs> today and and i look forward to hopefully having you in the future you know with just different things that come up i'd love to talk a little bit more about your role with loyal what yes. it's like to work with a coach that you scored more goals internationally than um things <laughs> Don't, tell him that. Don't remind him that. <laughs> every day, every day. Um, no, I just, hey, I appreciate you so much. And thanks for making time for us. And um, hopefully you've, you've also enjoyed the conversation. Thanks for being part of the podcast today. This is phenomenal. I'll be back anytime you guys want me. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Enjoy your day. Stay safe.